back. We're back. Um, what's up, Anna? <laughs> Nothing. Um, another day, another docket. Mm-hmm. We're watching the impeachment proceedings Vaguely. on uh, on mute. Yeah, but we're getting a good read for the you know kind of the impression of what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> Which is that these ugly people are debating something. Everyone's wearing really boxy suits. Mm-hmm. They look like um, school teachers that I had in the 90s. Yeah, they really do. They <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's pretty boring. Turns, yeah. out, turns out. I can't imagine people watching this for fun. Um, yeah, I can, I can s- imagine somebody watching it as background noise Boomers. as we do. Yeah. There's a lot of talk of... Um, the threat to constitutional democracy uh, that what, is impeachment? promised by Trump, oh. a spreading wave of authoritarianism that's taking over the globe. Mm-hmm. I'm like, remember when you guys called for all those endless wars? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Great. The Democrats, the do nothing Democrats. Yeah. Except for start all those endless wars. The Democrats are really like addicted to their own failure. They love losing. Yeah, they love to lose. Um, did you? This is not related. Did you hear about the girl who faked her, um, her abduction? Did you get an Amber? This, is it the sixteen-year-old? Yeah, w- she faked her own abduction. Carol with a K. Okay, you right. may have gotten an Amber Alert. Yesterday. I did get an Amber Alert. That was for lying ass Carol, who yeah. <laughs> like ran off on her own accord. What did she do? She like sat, like went and sat in a Dairy Queen or something. She like got she got some guy probably to take her take her away. Oh, and then okay. there's footage of her like running into the car, and she said it was because her mom is too controlling. Oh fuck! Mm. Is her mom Christian? Probably. Damn it! Why didn't I think of that? Like <laughs> faking an abduction. Yeah, I definitely like did like fantasize about 25-year-old it. Twenty-five-year-old guy kidnapped me. <laughs> you'll all be sorry when I'm kidnapped. Yeah. Then you'll really miss me. So does mm-hmm. does she have to face any justice? I hope not. Free Carol. Yeah, but like, is there punishment for faking your own abduction Probably. if you're a minor? If you're a, a, an adult, I'm sure. Um, probably who her, whoever her co-conspirator was will get in trouble, I imagine. Yeah. Well, uh, the person who probably also knocked her up while she was abducted. <laughs> yeah. But he at least has to pay for the plan B. Exactly. But pussy tax. <laughs> That's what Kyle was calling it yesterday. <laughs> um... You went to LA. I went to LA. Wait, did we discuss this on the last one? Yeah. Oh yeah, you've yeah. been back from LA. Yeah. I'm sorry. I've been back. I've been back two days, to be fair, or maybe three now. Hmm. I like LA. I miss LA. I would seriously move there. No, you wouldn't. I would fake my own death move and to move LA. to LA. <laughs> Transfer all your assets. Yeah, and then they to an offshore. Somebody account. would see me with like obviously like kind of rusty blonde hair <laughs> plastic well you get plastic surgery yeah i can get plastic surgery yeah. you get a ton of work done there yeah thirty thousand dollars worth of plastic <laughs> surgery <laughs> take the patreon money and run yeah i was complaining to dasha that i literally tried to apply for health care yesterday and it's easier for me to like log on to groupon and get a, a so, sweet like a menu of cosmetic procedures than it is to like get basic health care yeah true yeah it's such a bummer i'm gonna get ass injections despite the government (laughs) that'll show them yeah (laughs) Mm. don't move to la anna no i know new york's got it all my whole life is saw walking phoenix up in times square just moments ago he must all happening he must have a property in la though Mm. he probably lives there How, how did he look was he was he like joker skinny or did he pack on some pounds Mm, he had a coat on i don't know i didn't get a good i wasn't like ogling him i just registered walking phoenix wasn't gawking at him or anything yeah Mm. trying to zoom in on his cleft he looked looked good yeah um everyone's still talking about adam driver on twitter all day day long oh because he marched out of an npr recording Mm. because they played a clip of him in marriage story yeah to be fair they played the worst clip which is him doing karaoke in the end as i understand it was that particular like maudlin and pathetic sequence which i liked yeah of course for that reason yeah but uh, he didn't like he didn't want to see it yeah he didn't want to bear witness would you do that 
no. <laughs> You'd be like, play it again. I'd be like, yeah, let's watch it again. <laughs> Great work. <laughs> mm. No, God, no. But I, I don't invite mind. them to screening at your house. <laughs> <laughs> Make them watch the Darby Bernard. <laughs> Let's see what else I can do. <laughs> um, so what is on the docket? Um, let's see. Gia. Oh, did you hear Peter Sheldahl has lung cancer? Oh, that's what that was all about. Mm-hmm. He's, but he's like imminently he, dying. That's horrible. He wrote a really beautiful um, essay about it yeah i remember peter sheldahl was like the the art critic you read before you read jerry saltz if you were in in any sort of art history program he's way better than jerry i know i know and probably and less horny or if he is horny he keeps it more under wraps no one's as horny as jerry saltz no no i (laughs) though i argue that that's his charm a lot of people are like that guy sucks he's a misogynist and a dirty old man i was like that's the only redeeming thing about him (laughs) that he's like so unabashedly horny because it means that he's like a human and yeah, not a lizard exactly not um, like these people at the impeachment proceedings yeah and anti-horny well i'm sorry to hear about peter sheldahl mm-hmm. though he's like in his 80s so he's had a good run yeah yeah and he seems at peace with that yeah based on he's probably tired of living I mean, to begin God, with life just goes on yeah. and on people say time goes by fast feels so slow yeah i know <laughs> But we are nearing the end of the, the decade. Yeah, that's true. I always forget about that. 2020. I want it to feel more special, but it feels like nothing. Do you like New Year's Eve? No, we got. It depends. Uh, I was also telling you, like the New Year's Eve and, and Halloween are like um, amateur holidays. Mm. They're like holidays for uh, freshmen and people who like SantaCon. Fucking SantaCon. <laughs> I didn't go outside all day during SantaCon. Uh, roommate Leia was embedded. For work. In SantaCon. Uh, for yeah. work, guys. Yeah. She looked like she was having a good time. But she yeah, loves like, that. She loves going to like EDM festivals yeah. too. She has a really high tolerance for um, norm- normal retards. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for like n- normie displays of stupidity. Um, and she was like with all these Santa guys. Yeah. Um, <laughs> who were like railing lines yeah of course or so i heard i obviously wasn't there because i don't do drugs I never, but yeah um i would never do drugs or wear a santa hat recreationally <laughs> i have um i am i have like ptsd for from santa con even though i've never actually participated in santa con nor would i ever well they really run rampant around they the take city. over the streets mm-hmm. they like shut down all the blocks mm-hmm. and it's like a collection of the most rapey guys ever yeah big time like uh whatever Imagine first getting year raped medical by a guy residency. Residency. yeah <laughs> that would really sting yeah and it's like horrible i feel so bad for them also because they're all wearing <laughs> these like really flimsy kind of chinese made polyester suits that are supposed to look warm and cozy but they just look like halloween costumes they're like paper thin yeah like they're the sheets at metropolitan correctional <laughs> 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 straight men love being underdressed in the winter though they love like walking around in only a button-down shirt mm. with their hands stuffed down <laughs> yeah and like boat shoes with no socks yeah like pretending they're not freezing like it's okay babe it's okay <laughs> we're going to pianos <laughs> they're like waiting for the chance to take their socks off yeah mm the first available moment yeah like always mm-hmm. and the minute that it goes above 50 they're wearing like shorts and flip-flops yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no gay guys do that too you like you know a gay guy is about to fucking suck for the rest of the night when he shows up to party early wearing only a t-shirt yeah everybody's right. like bundled up and he's like hey guys gotta go my uber's here because <laughs> they just go from uber to yeah um to sucking and fucking yeah they're like my boyfriend's out of town i'll s- catch you guys later <laughs> <laughs> time to suck the night away yeah <laughs> i'm going to grace papaya <laughs> to meet some homo thugs <laughs> i shouldn't say that you shouldn't no. but but you do yeah <laughs> oh um anyway so gia tolentino wrote an article in the new yorker about instagram face instagram face the new the craze that's been sweeping the nation for the last 10 years yeah 
or the globe even it it hasn't been 10 years though i feel like peak instagram face is probably like two years old Mm -hmm. because people were really kind of uh feeling their way in the dark trying to get a sense for this hot new medium right so it didn't really took us a while to to really figure it out but now we've now we've pretty much nailed it yeah did did you see um kendall jenner's new face no well yeah i heard she got botox in her um eyebrows or something something like that but like she of all people doesn't need no of course not tweaks Mm. you could even argue for a person who's that perfect the imperfections kind of make her right so when she looks like a total like doll it's weird and textureless but i haven't seen i'll take a look you should look it's in her stories and maybe they're expired now um Hmm. kumail nanjani should get instagram face (laughs) now that he's ripped but we'll get get... now that he's a new body yeah uh i was typing in kendall jenner then i started typing in kumail but i don't need to see oh my god her face (gasps) oh it's no i know (gasps) oh she does look hot though she does i mean yeah Mm -hmm. there's no way she can't look hot i mean that's scary she's so hot it's scary yeah i'm I'm chills (laughs) wow damn okay well we we, we'll probably get work done eventually yeah you know again seeing as i can't get health care i might as well you might as well have a perfect doll like face yeah and then like you know the implants and injections will all seep into my bloodstream and the health insurance companies will deny my claims because (laughs) it's a pre-existing condition (laughs) <laughs> your silicone breast implant ruptured and poisoned your bloodstream and <laughs> well that's the thing that always drove me nuts about um yolanda from real housewives she's like two of my three children have lyme's disease and i do too we have autoimmune <laughs> problems and i was like no you don't your <laughs> breast implant your 10 year old breast implant burst and leaked into your sternum and now you're like hallucinating and have lupus from <laughs> industrial grade <laughs> materials coursing through your veins <laughs> i'm a i'm not a lyme disease truther though i believe it in lyme disease yeah i do too this kid i knew in like second grade got lyme's disease and it was weird but i don't know his mom was also crazy yeah i believe in it i think you know even if it has like a dimension of hypochondria or psychosomatic elements then like i don't know if people say they're sick i'm like you must be sick yeah who am Wait. i who am i to no, I know. Who are you to to it, deny someone their Lyme Lyme's disease? Yeah, <laughs> believe women. <laughs> um. So yeah, wait. So should we mock Kumail Nanjani and then get into the Instagram <laughs> thing? I'm just chomping at the bit. Yeah, let's do it. So he's gonna do it, some Marvel movie. Yeah, some The Eternals, which is also starring Angelina Jolie and Salma Hayek. Ooh, I can't wait to not go see that. Yeah. <laughs> And so he hit the gym pretty hard. Yeah, and wrote a long ass Instagram caption <laughs> where he was like kind of humble bragging and backhandedly thanking. He was like, this wouldn't have been possible without like the elite team of trainers and nutritionists that Marvel set me up with over the course <laughs> of this process. It's been a real journey. Thank you to my <laughs> wife. I'll be interesting again soon, implying that he'll return to being like a normal reasonable Wait. human being who like <sighs> likes to pig out on chicken wings or whatever americans yeah. eat and have interesting thoughts yeah and i was like going to the gym yeah and i was like you've never been interesting <laughs> yeah we've never respected you <laughs> his, his wife is like a a chick who looks like she's from austin and has an undercut yep <laughs> she has an undercut i know people are gonna be like well look at your hair but like she has an undercut that Mm-hmm. that's the most normie edgy haircut you could ever have i had an undercut in college yeah exactly in college <laughs> i'm not afraid to admit how it. many years ago was that three <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> no like 10 I was 18 like, months ago yeah <laughs> i'm still in college actually i'm getting ready for my finals um no i was like 19 so yeah about a decade ago yeah a decade ago mm. that that was the only acceptable time to have an undercut yeah but let's let's talk about that body the body not for me not too much <laughs> yeah way too much gross what well i just okay yeah. is kumail a one or a zero on the binary 
zero zero okay good. hard Thanks hard God. zero see i hate myself because he's always been a one i remember he used to what? be on this um comedy video series with tj miller called blurreds mm-hmm. <laughs> and then they end up doing silicon valley together and there's this really great skit that's so corny where he's like at a job interview and the interviewer is like well what's your weakness and he's like chocolate and he like rips open his shirt and uh, revealing like an elaborate network of ivs mm-hmm. pumping chocolate into his bloodstream which sounds awful but yeah. was actually really funny <laughs> he so was you he would was, fuck him for yeah the... i would begrudgingly i would <laughs> fuck the liberalism out of him <laughs> that's the project i would have sex with him before and after which is Both. so depressing which one would you would you rather mm, after but he'd have to let the muscles slack in a little i'm not into like chiseled abs. hard body yeah yeah it's a little weird it's not yeah i don't i don't i've never liked it i mainly like hate his like smug expression you can tell that he's like one of those guys who has his ear open at parties <laughs> like trying to overhear if anybody's mentioned him right i rode the train with him once like i was standing <laughs> next to him well wow, you we have weren't... a whole history with kumail that i yeah. have no idea a wow. weird psychosexual history where i mail packages I think I to his him. manager's I think I... office <laughs> I think I blocked him on Twitter actually. Wait, why? Because he was getting on my fucking nerves. Because he's a gamer and a libtard. Yeah, exactly. He, he's, he's like on, the he's worst about something. combination, yeah. The big sick. Can I um have a cigarette? Yeah. Please, mommy. I don't know where the oh here. Thank you. Um can baby have a cigarette? Yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh Instagram face. Instagram face. Mm-hmm. I just th- th- my last thing yeah, go, go off. about mm. about uh, Kumail Nanjani is that he illustrates that actually women are not much different than men because the minute that you lose any weight, you're like out there plastering your naked body all over the Being place. Guilty as charged. Yeah. yeah. Well, they probably forced him to. He probably was contractually obligated to flaunt his hard body by Marvel. Yeah. He was like, no, don't don't make me do this. It's well, against they my they integrity. Taking like schlubby like comedy guys and making them into heartthrobs that's what happened to chris pratt Mm -hmm. and i liked him better fat too yeah Um, he looks when he was fat he looked kind of like a a nice what did you say about john krasinski recently i don't remember i said that oh you said we're we're nearing the end of times when john krasinski is a leading man yeah it's so (laughs) weird he just doesn't have it i mean he's obviously like very cute and endearing and whatever but he's not like tom cruise or brad pitt no offense he just doesn't have it (laughs) i agree he's a comedic actor they should really like uh they should work their magic on bj novak oh my god turn him into a leading man (laughs) he's next yeah they're like this guy kind of looks like ben stiller (laughs) he unfollowed me obviously Uh oh oh Oh, because we talked shit on him oh come on Mm mm-hmm we're, that, just ha- we're just having fun that's a litmus test i think like if you can't handle it if you can't handle the heat get out of the pod yes <laughs> <laughs> get out of the neoliberal war room uh, okay so Insta great face. on the record you would fuck kumail nanjani got it yeah i hope this doesn't come back to bite me when you have when you <laughs> when when I you have, have to, to fuck him <laughs> begrudgingly yeah i'm like oh, i really don't want to do this <laughs> i was just uh, kidding i can't have sex with a man who games no definitely not i mean you can't touch my body if you've touched a gaming controller <laughs> i don't even know what they're called <laughs> a joystick <laughs> uh yeah con the console's the the thing yeah they should the- make like pussy <laughs> shape <laughs> uh whatever uh they consoles probably do in japan so that these guys could kill two birds with one stone and they can like game they can like murder syrian refugees on screen <laughs> but also they could learn like figure out their way around a woman's anatomy because i guarantee you they don't know well that game i did the voice for won some kind of award uh-huh disco elysium yeah they're saying it's one of the best video games of all time apparently I that's don't know, cool i guess did you get a payday i got paid that's cool yeah 
And wait, what, what's your involvement in the game? You have like some like sexy horse vocal fry yeah. segment on there? Yeah, yeah okay. I do an intense vocal fry. Okay. It's like about a detective or something. And I'm like, hey, detective. I'm like, <laughs> I forget what I say. Yeah, I'm like, uh, don't you know we're in hell or whatever. Stuff like that. So a lot of actors do voice work for video games. No, more and more. Okay, well, that, that sort of somewhat rehabilitates video games for me well, have just, you ever played video games in any sustained way no right i played nintendo 64 when i was a kid i played mario i guess but no i used to play wayne, Gret- wayne gretzky 3d hockey with my dad oh that's hot <laughs> yeah kind of was mm, no god of course not what if i'm gonna do escapism i'm gonna do you know something more interesting like yeah, drugs. like drugs in a hotel room. <laughs> ketamine. Like ketamine, exactly. Why play video games when you do ketamine? <laughs> Moving on. Moving on to Instagram face. Yeah. The age of Instagram face by Gia Tolentino in The New Yorker. Mm-hmm. Um, and she talks about the emergence of a, a single cyborgian face among professionally beautiful women on Instagram. Right. And how this is trickling down to not professionally beautiful women on instagram right and she goes to she does the thing that journalists love to do where they go to get plastic surgery consultations under the guise of being a more shallow than they think they are yeah investigative reporting Mm -hmm. um i i i've talked a lot of shit on gia tolentino in in the past but she does have a kind of a really great spidey sense for Mm cherry picking certain cultural phenoms that are hard to diagnose and explain yeah like instant like literally i was thinking about instagram face in the days leading up to this article coming out yeah probably because i was in la and there's a lot of instagram face there there really is yeah do you follow any like instagram girls um that's a good question my feed's not like overrun by them really no, there's a lot of them on my explore page. I follow mostly hot IDF girls mm-hmm. who haven't been totally taken over by the Instagram craze. And then I follow like weird, ugly, hot art girls. Yeah. Who also who are doing another. Are doing a different kind of thing. So who are posting pictures of trash and stuff. Yeah. And like still bleaching their eyebrows. Yeah. Right. right, right. And wearing like really ugly masks. <laughs> What do you mean? Like, there's a lot of girls on Instagram. (laughs) There's a lot of girls who wear, like, weird, ugly makeup and or masks. Like, they'll draw boils on their faces instead of freckles. What are you talking about? This is a thing. It's a very minute thing. But maybe it'll take, it'll gain some steam. Or they, they're, like, all these girls who are, like, basically, like, music, like, avant-garde musicians slash performance artists. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like, this one girl, Daniela Lolita. Mm. she's a latina Mm-mm. she's beautiful she looks kind of like dark world gwen stefani or something and her whole shtick is like bleaching her eyebrows and wearing like ugly prosthetic makeup huh. it's like the opposite of instagram face right like black eyes yeah it's like abject I, think black eye, I think black eyes should come back yeah that should be the next i lost my freckle pen so maybe i'll get into you'll black, get into black eyes. black eyes <laughs> drawing them on myself every day so no i don't follow i don't really follow the kind of top tier of like purely instagram models yeah aspirational yeah and it's not even because they make me feel bad or anything at this point it's just it's so weird and pointless it's like background noise yeah they're like muzak well the line those sort of Gia Tolentino describes kind of how like with the advent of like face tuning and Snapchat filters, how that has sort of bled over into like cosmetic procedures. Yeah. How that it's created this like standard of beauty now. Yeah. Because people bring their face tuned like Snapchat and Instagram story photos to plastic surgeons and say, give me that. Or they bring, I'm surprised that people still like the main photo that people bring in is Kim Kardashian. I know that's, yeah, that's another thing she describes. Yeah. And really? She, yeah, I know. I mean, Kim Kardashian is like beautiful, obviously, but she's also so at this point, generic and textureless. Well, that's what we want. 
I guess. Do you, I mean, do you want that? No, of course no, not. No, right? No. It's a weird... She, But she describes the face. I'm going to read the quote here. Um, it's a young face, of course, with poreless skin and plump high cheekbones. It has cat-like eyes and long cartoonish lashes. It has a small, neat nose and full lush lips. It looks at you coyly but blankly as if its owner had taken half a clonopin and is considering asking you for a private jet ride to Coachella. Mm-hmm. The face is distinctly white but ambiguously ethnic. It suggests a national ge- geographic composite illustrating what Americans will look like in 2050 if every American of the future were to be a direct descendant of Kim Kardashian West, Bella Hadid, Emily Radichkowski and Kendall Jenner, who looks exactly like Emily Radichkowski, which isn't true. It's not true. They actually look quite different. Quite different. They just have a similar coloring. Um, <laughs> but she talks about how the algorithm sort of privileges generic sameness. Yeah, right. And in my mind, this is essentially like what happens when you open up aesthetics or like beauty standards to like a democratic voting process, and it becomes anything but democratic. Yeah, because at the end of the day, there's only a small elite of people who have like the basic uh, kind of bare foundation to pull that look off. Like you have to be born somewhat genetically gifted. Sure. You can't totally change your face and body. I mean, you kind of can. You can now, but it's like Bella Hadid, right? Like she. Bella Hadid's got changed she has her face. Serious work. Yeah. yeah. Very well done. But she had some bare rudiments that allowed her to pull that off she just had money she had money but she had i don't know like the kind of length of the face or the head shape and she got like a really good nose job yeah i'm not a big proponent of nose jobs but occasionally a nose job is beneficial i think in bella hadid's case it was well she got her jaw shaved down yeah which is crazy that's what i'm more concerned about because i think people think of obvious things like botox fillers nose jobs but there's all these other tiny little tweaks like you can now do the non-surgical nose job where they inject filler into your I nose. I don't really understand how that works. I don't understand how that works because you're building on an existing foundation. Yeah. I would get my jaw shaved down. To get facial feminization surgery. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've like literally thought of that. Yeah. I want to look like a Korean pop, yeah. pop star. If I'm well, going to get work done, then I'm going to get... I'm gonna you're going to look like that girl who like hanged herself in her hotel room. <laughs> That's the photo I'll bring to yeah. the plastic surgeon's office. <laughs> um (laughs) uh do you think it is a distinctly white face though no i actually dispute that yeah i think that that this is also what happens when you have true multiculturalism and yeah this kind of yeah and it's like you know i got in trouble before for saying america is not a white supremacist country Mm -hmm. and i will uh kind of I defend, I will stand by those remarks because there is a way that America was founded on white supremacy, obviously, and the way in which it replicates certain white supremacist. Yeah, structurally. Modes of oppression through political and economic policy, but culturally America is anything but a white supremacist country. Yeah, but is that meaningful? Yeah, I think so. If we culturally fetishize multiculturalism i mean i think like i agree with breitbart that politics is downstream from culture it culture changes politics in a way yeah the scary thing is that america is a capitalist country so now you have basically kind of a representational democracy where every kind of race is represented Mm. but there's still kind of the elite one percent who are voting in in the interest of their own like advancement class advancement right and people profit margins Mm -hmm. right that people vote and make decisions based on their class interests yeah before their racial interests yeah so like you see people like kamala harris and cory booker who are not allies of black people by any means even though they're black right um but like on a on a cultural level this face that we're seeing she actually has a really good description of of it about how um she talks about how it's a face that um has a south asian influence with the brows and eye shape and african-american influence with the lips a caucasian influence with the nose and a cheek structure that is predominantly native american or middle eastern Mm -hmm. so this is this fashion or celebrity makeup artist colby smith who kind of breaks it down i mean i don't know if that's a hundred percent accurate but yeah bit of a stretch it's a stretch but you see all these like elements of different races and ethnicities yeah coming together in one person 
but that like but obviously people getting like spray tans and lip fillers doesn't do anything for well it doesn't help black people meaningfully yeah exactly but people are so in that way what i don't know what utility does the trickle down really have if we can change you know beauty standards i mean i think it'll it'll like this sort of thing will win over time you know there's going to be more black people more latino people in the country they're going to eventually gain more power it's inevitable but i think on a cultural level i'm not making the case that it's like necessarily productive for the pocket books books of minorities but it's like a thing that we have to acknowledge that white beauty is no longer the reigning beauty standard yeah even though probably the the majority of the influencers happen to be white because they're the people who already have money and like come from wealthy families and whatever who can get the procedures that give them this yeah the edge the the coveted face yeah yeah but kim kardashian is interesting because she's a woman who i think became famous because she is ethnically ambiguous looking and appeals to all races Mm -hmm. like she could be white she could be latina she could be biracial right she married a black guy she sure did yeah and i'm all I'm, i've said this a million times on the pod but i'm certain that when she was growing up in calabasas or whatever she was the odd one out because that kind of population was filled with girls who looked like nikki and paris hilton right so she kind of revolted against that aesthetically on some level and ended up winning through no credit to her because it's not like she changed the beauty standard standard single-handedly no right but yeah she rose above yeah and now that's and now the, she's has the most sought over face in beverly hills yeah and we also like forget it's not just the faces the proportions the beauty standards like the body standards are changing having a big huge yeah. ass you yeah know? <laughs> having a big ass <laughs> being bit like thicker in general yeah well waves are gonna come back they soon. will I, it's also i've cool. got a trend forecast that <laughs> Your trend i think forecast. heroin chic's gonna come back in 2020 no it probably won't um <clears throat> no sure but that's uh that changes all the time like body bo- body standards yeah and i think it changes like in a cyclical fashion so now thick chicks are in pogs whatever <laughs> In 10, 15 years when we're all uh, dying of climate change related illness, <laughs> something Food else shortages. will come about. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's a weird, but you take even like the rise of somebody like Lizzo. God. Yeah. What? Who's, well, she's a testament to the fact that multiculturalism has triumphed, at least on the cultural level. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that you can dispute that, really. Yeah. Have you seen that video of her, like, wearing a leotard, like, climbing on a table and, like, face planting into it? I, I did not. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think I saw it and chose not to, chose not to watch it. Yeah. Well, the trick, I guess my feeling about it is the trick is going to be making sure that the political and economic policies moving forward in the future are in line with the kind of purely representational Mm -hmm. Uh, like the representation of minorities in the culture because you're right because if they're just being kind of like touted as beauty icons but get nothing in return then it's kind of like uh, whack and unfair yeah anyway so she tolentino was talking about um apparently more than there was more than seven million neurotoxin injections in 2018 what's neurotoxin it's like filler botox i think it's botox yeah and oh no it's botox yeah and then more than two and a half million filler injections and americans spent 16.5 billion dollars on cosmetic surgery that's crazy which is crazy and 92 percent of those procedures were performed on women of course so and then the guy's getting the chad surgeries yeah um the celebrity makeup artist she talks to also sort of has like an optimistic view of it Mm -hmm. until she presses him and he says no of course it's obviously horrifying but he says that because we're becoming an increasingly visual culture Mm -hmm. that people want the stakes have sort of been raised for how you visually are represented yeah i don't do you buy that i don't Mm. think we're increasingly visual i think humans have always been visual on some level um i think 
in as much as images are information i think you know when we are in the post information age yeah i think that that's like the real problem that there is a surfeit of information there's an excess of information with the internet so you can constantly compare yourself to other people and optimize mm-hmm. things in yourself that you see in them and are like inspired by like you can go down like your explorer page and be like well i want her eyebrows i want her nose i want her cheekbones i want her lips i want her skin color her hair texture like you can go on and on and on yeah so it's like this weird like crowdsourced beauty like instagram yeah and it approaches algorithmic yeah and approaches beauty yeah and then it makes you question whether democracy is good as such (laughs) that's the big question um she also talks about how um she talks about like this kind kind of like liberal feminist idea that objectification is uh or self-objectification is progressive and empowering right and she kind of pushes back on it via like the body positive movement yeah how do you feel about that um i mean i think it's obviously disempowering because in the end you like it's just a void you know yeah and what happens to all these girls who all look like one really ultra hot girl (laughs) they become ultra hot with the same ultra hot woman (laughs) i know but what happens when like i mean you have to like the thing with like cosmetic procedures too is that you have to um you have to keep getting you have to keep getting them yeah so you have to make sure that you have it's almost like a an Ouroboros, like a self-fulfilling thing because you have to get the procedures to be like an influencer on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And in order to have to, to like, you have to like keep getting the procedures to keep accruing followers and possibly profit. I don't know if they're actually making any money. I can't imagine that they would be like, there's too many of them. Yeah. And I feel like what's going to happen is like eventually the women that are going to get like an edge up are the ones who look weird and different. Because they have something special to offer. I hope so. But who knows also? Maybe a little lazy eye. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, Maybe a slight inbred look could come back back in fashion. (laughs) I think I look inbred. That's what I decided. (laughs) That's your new thing. That's my new thing. (laughs) Is uh, talking about how I I think I look inbred, but I think it's good. I think it's aristocratic. That's really nationalistic. <laughs> like a sickly Russian princess. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I just want like, yeah. I I would like it if health wasn't like a predominant aspect of, of, of beauty standards. Really? Yeah. What do you mean? Like dewy youthfulness? No, just like, yeah. Yeah. And like fitness and stuff. I guess I'm just nostalgic for uh truly the hair like the 90s <laughs> yeah <laughs> it was me cool too. to look sick i liked women more when they were like really stunning and beautiful because you could see that they would be like decrepit and ugly what do you mean because it was like a fleeting thing it, right like it right. Was i think beauty should be kind of that's, fleeting has, and it has it should like it's most special when it has like an ephemeral quality yeah and it's like you know like people were talking about like anna karina and brigitte bardot and they were like well you know this or like danube or somebody they were like those chicks look awful now (laughs) like before anna karina died she looked really like scary and old and i think she looked beautiful but like in a different way in a way that was like appropriate to her age sure i appreciate that she didn't try to get like a face full of like tweaks Bardot really looks like a monster. Yeah. Um, But that's because she's got bad politics. It's because she's a raging Islamophobe. (laughs) (laughs) It's because she's wretched inside. You get the face you deserve, Angelica Houston, baby. What's up with Angelica Houston? That's what she said. Oh, okay. She said, you get the face you deserve. Well, she doesn't look so great now. Well, she looks all right. She looks like a normal woman of her age. Yeah. I'm just saying, I'm just making a case for, like, if you're wretched inside, you'll become wretched outside. Yeah. Yeah. And, like... Like these people at the impeachment proceeding. Yeah. They all... In their boxy suits mm-hmm. and bad makeup. This woman actually has pretty decent makeup. The first one I've seen. She's wearing, like, a Bobby Brown nude lip. <laughs> um, <laughs> Susan Delbean. And the other thing is, like, you know, back in the day, 
she Tolentino points out mm-hmm. how it was considered shameful and like taboo to advertise your services as a cosmetic surgeon. And it was also considered shameful and taboo to advertise the work that you had done as a client of right. cosmetic surgery. And now uh, not only do plastic surgeons have like really influential multi-thousand follower accounts on Instagram, but people are volunteering, like the people that went to their office. They're not even getting paid. They're not getting paid, but they're volunteering to like show their pics and write like client testimonials, which that I find totally disturbing. That people aren't ashamed of having cosmetic so much work. And now there's like a record. I mean, like you can't, you can't get plastic surgery now if you're like famous, micro famous, whatever, without somebody like digging it up and, Right, there's a Doing record. There's a sides. record of your your previous face. Yeah, that exists forever. Yeah, and it's like I don't know. I mean, it's it, she also um, she quoted a line from this philosopher Heather Widows from this book Perfect Me, where she says, "Choice cannot make an unjust or exploitative practice or act somehow magically just or non-exploitative." which is like how I feel about it too. It's like abortion. It's not really a choice again, if people don't have a meaningful alternative, like healthcare, for example. Exactly. If you don't have the choice to have a baby, then you can't be, you can't really say you're pro-choice. Yeah. Because you can't afford to have a baby. I mean, right. My feeling is like everybody, even the rich are so spiritually miserable. Now they're like, so spiritually impoverished, even if they're not kind of circumstantially impoverished. Mm -hmm. So, everybody has kind of like is investing in this practice of like borrowing against the future forever upgrading and optimizing right and that's going to run out it's going to run out inevitably like capitalism yeah and it's like the logical conclusion of the kind of liberal capitalist mandate on individual self-actualization sorry that sounds like a lot of words but that's what it is Mm mm-hmm like well, the the idea that happiness that you should be a first that you should be pursuing happiness right that that's the goal and meaning of life and b that you can attain happiness by solely fo- focusing on yourself and self improvement and self advancement self actualization yeah. right totally and that sort of the thing about choice also goes back to the self objectification right as you're saying like no I because I'm like choosing to do it. Mm-hmm. it makes it morally virtuous or, new- or right. neutral at least and that's just not the case it's not the case and also like there's a point where um being that kind of professionally beautiful must have its downside i mean you have to like really i don't know what each of these girls wants for themselves but i highly doubt that any reasonable sane man could ever <laughs> fall in love with a woman who's that fixated on her own appearance because it's pathological sure certainly yeah and it's like it's the same thing as obesity i mean like i said this a million times but america is in the business of uh, normalizing pathology and pathologizing normalcy yep Mm -hmm. and there's no i mean do you ever get that um impression when you look at photos of women who haven't gotten work done who are who were considered or are still considered beautiful like you take somebody like juliette binoche right Mm -hmm. she looks kind of like plain and worn down compared to somebody who has had like a mountain of work done. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I I think she prefer Binoche say to like Kate Beckinsale or someone who has like, or Nicole Kidman has that like feline face now. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree. I do too. Had she not gotten work done, you know? Yeah. But it looks jarring. Yeah. It looks frightening. And it's almost shocking. It's almost shocking that like, somebody like Binoche would double down and not get any work done. Yeah. Do you think Huppert has had work done? I think she probably has fillers. Yeah. Or Botox. Probably Botox. She looks great. It seems pretty subtle. She's aging very gracefully. Yeah, she looks great. But I feel like, I mean, I sound like a boomer now, but I feel like people have totally lost touch with what women actually look like. Right. That's sort of the thesis of Instagram face, right? Yeah. Is that it's been warped by technology. Yeah, mm-hmm. it is. It's like, I mean, again, I'm so, I'm always so stunned by the capacity of people to overlook 
uh, the kind of question of consent when it comes to opaque technological processes. They're like, it doesn't occur to them that they're really selling their soul to Satan when they willfully fully participate in like the Instagram economy or get like right. uh, non-surgical cosmetic procedures. Mm-hmm. The trick is like, where do you draw the line? Cause I would totally do it down the line also. Would draw the line where? What do you mean in regards to what? Like, where do you draw the line with like cosmetic work? In a, personally? Yeah. Or like as wh- a society? Yeah. Like how do you know when it's time to stop? You don't. You don't. That's what it's, it becomes addictive. I'm always also shocked by like people who get one tweak and they look great and then they get another one. It's like, okay. And they get a third one and they start to look like a you weird really lizard. Rolling the dice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, what's her face? Uh, fuck. Never mind. I can't remember her name. She's had like disastrous plastic surgery. Laura Flynn Boyle. Oh, yeah. And she was so and beautiful. She was stunning. Sad. She yeah. I remember when she was like really anorexic and wore the ballerina costume on the red carpet. Yeah. Those were the Jack Nicholson days. <laughs> <laughs> Jack Nicholson always had kind of Instagram girl face and he never had to do what anything. Mean, the, the arched brow. Yeah, he looked like a weird <laughs> tomcat. <laughs> that coy smile. Yeah. It's like cat like archaic grin. <laughs> I don't know. Mm. This this makes me all, like ext- I I don't even have any good or smart insights. It makes me extremely pessimistic. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't it make you pessimistic? Mm. I guess I feel sort of neutral about it. I feel like it's the spirit of our times. Yeah, the spirit of capitalism. Yeah, we get the you know the beauty idols we deserve. That's true. Yeah. I mean, I Koreans have been doing it forever. Like, you're basically a pariah in uh, South Korea if you don't have plastic surgery. Yeah. No, they they really go nuts for it there, and they're really good at it. It's crazy. Yeah, they get their, like, eyelids done, their chin I've heard of down. Like, Korean men suing their wives because they um, have babies, and the babies aren't. <laughs> don't look so good. Oh, yeah, they come out with, like, a hair lip. <laughs> they're not like deformed but they're not yeah yeah the really muscular jaw they're somehow like tan and not like perfectly porcelain white i guess the like sort of dystopian conclusion would be doing plastic surgery on babies yeah but that's where it's headed <laughs> basically yeah well it's it's where it's headed headed is that the ultra rich um will not only hoard all the resources when the planet becomes untenable due to glo- uh, global warming but they'll be able to engineer and pre like pre-design their children right eugenics yeah which is, eugenics. Which is crazy mm-hmm. and the scary thing is that it's going to be in america it's going to be totally multicultural hmm. like it's going to be kind of the kushner trumps but it's also going to be the pinkett smiths right 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 the one percent is going to transcend yeah it will always transcend race mm. and you know my mom actually when we were growing up she said she she's kind of like a conspiracy theorist and this is before way before the era of instagram and like cheap cosmetic surgery she was like everybody's gonna look like a kind of multicultural tri-racial like white black asian infinitely youthful infinitely adorable person in the future Mm -hmm. well everybody who can afford it right while like the poor fight for scraps in a hunger games type scenario (laughs) (laughs) and that this is yeah and the idea that it's kind of a utopian ideal when it's actually quite the opposite yeah it's dystopian should we talk about boys yeah well i guess margaret atwood was right about women becoming cyborgs sure i mean okay when margaret atwood said that is that margaret atwood yeah who wrote the cyborg manifesto oh no it was donna haraway i'm donna stupid Har- yeah. I, I get my the, uh, handmaid's tale oh yeah okay true shit i get my like um waspy liberal white doyens of feminist theory confused right. master's house master's yeah. jewels who knows <laughs> no it was donna haraway but when yeah. i when i thought of when i think of like a female cyborg i think of like rose mcgowan mm with like the metal leg what movie was that it was like the tarantino uh, death uh, proof yeah yeah of whatever the movie was that went along with well death that's proof. sort of what haraway talks about too. yeah i think like of a woman equipped with a microchip that allows her to speak any language on cue mm. but it's not that it's just like a logical extension between 
a female body sorry to use that word bodies and spaces and <laughs> like a social media technology right snapchat yeah Ugh. the fusion of flesh and tech yeah it's scary yikes <laughs> God, I think my but. lucky star is that I'm an old broad and don't have to participate. You can just op the fuck out. You take it's selfies all the time. No, I take now. selfies, but I don't have to. I'm not 19. I don't have to participate in that economy, and I couldn't anyway if I wanted to. And it's a good freeing feeling. Right. I'm gonna get freckles tattooed on my <laughs> yep, face because yeah. I keep losing my freckle pen. <laughs> just get like really like. Um, I just want to permanently have a little dot of highlighter on the tip on the tip of your nose. Yeah. And yeah, <laughs> blush across the bridge. <clears throat> yeah, it's annoying putting on makeup. It's fun. It takes a lot of time. Okay, uh, boys. Boys, boys, boys. Boys are going to be getting the plastic surgery too. Well, that's the, the incel phenomenon, is there? The chad surgery. I don't buy that. I don't think it, uh, people are getting widespread chad surgery. Right. Um. Okay, boys. Okay, there's another article mm-hmm. in the Atlantic. We've been reading a lot. Yeah, we've been reading by Peggy Orenstein called The Miseducation of the American Boy. Mm-hmm. Um, she, the lead is why boys crack up at rape jokes, think having a girlfriend is, quote, gay <laughs> and still can't cry and why we need to give them new and better models of masculinity. Having a girlfriend is gay. It is, yeah. <laughs> They're right about that. Um, and yeah, so she talked to like a hundred boys or something. It was the sample size. I don't know. Yeah, she, the ages, she, like teenage boys about their emotional lives. She interviewed dozens of boys. <laughs> She's she got the stats. Yeah. What did you think of the article? Mm, nothing. Yeah, cool. Let's, let's, just call, let's just call it a day. Yeah. Then. <laughs> um, it's it's one of those like special interest articles that's like comes out every two years on uh, on the Atlantic or on Salon about toxic masculinity yeah or like how we need to provide new male role models for boys when i was looking up the article i googled boyhood and the atlantic and like sandwiched between a bunch of reviews of the link later film Mm. there was this article called um imagining a better boyhood uh which argued as boys grow up the process of becoming men encourages them to shed the sort of intimate connections and emotional intelligence that add meaning to life this is um from 2018 by sarah rich yeah so they do this all the time so they do it all the time yeah it's like you know every 18 months uh the cut or something publishes an article on polyamory yeah (laughs) i think but that made me wonder like who is this for right it's not for boys it's not for boys it's like euphoria there are no teens teens watching euphoria um (laughs) uh and she, well, I guess what I thought about it was, so she describes how a lot of the boys, they talked about crying a lot and how they like, can't cry, can't cry yeah. or like, um, feel like the sort of emotional deprivation. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I just, just felt keenly aware of like her role as this reporter, right. Mm-hmm. Talking to these boys who actually, are very emotionally sophisticated because they understand that they're sort of following a script wherein they know that they're like, it's kind of like they're talking about, they're having like a meta conversation right? about how they know, they understand that they <laughs> are being interviewed <laughs> about these up. issues yeah. for, by yeah, a yeah. woman. And so they're like modulating their responses subconsciously on at least two different levels. Exactly. And yeah. so they know that the yeah that the conversation is that boys aren't supposed to cry, yeah. And so they're actually having this like conversation about the discourse instead of actually talking about their real emotional reality. Yeah, exactly. And there's and every two years, some thirty-seven year old adult with like a recorder shows up and is like, <laughs> "We have to invent new models for you." Yeah, we're telling you. <laughs> that the way you're doing things is wrong and it's like they're like okay i'm sure they instinctively feel it's weird but they're like okay i'll follow along and appease this nice lady reporter yeah what did you make of the boys talking about sort of the mortifying uh early sexual experiences i think that's another i mean look that's another kind of there is one boy nate who was uh, interviewed 
uh, all the names are changed, obviously, um, who had a kind of a hookup uh, gone wrong with his classmate, Nicole, at a, at a house party. And he like fingered, her, fingered wrong. her wrong. And she <laughs> roasted him later. And he texted her and was like, hey, like, I'm sorry, but I, I don't know why you had to roast me. And then she apologized. And it was like this whole thing. And I was like, well, this sounds like a to- totally normal, typical par for the course yeah par for the course Mm -hmm. uh aspect of like growing up yeah it's not just boys it's like girls too we all have awkward social and sexual experiences we stumble through life when we're teenagers and as adults as well and as adults yeah i do think girls are more vicious in that regard yeah absolutely and then like in terms of locker room talk i think that girls as well are more like willing to disclose and ridicule and you know go into detail well one of the boys literally says this he's like look we like rate girls on a scale of one to ten they describe our penises in great detail and mock them (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah i mean it's true girls are more i think verbal and sophisticated at that age yeah vicious yeah and they and they have a different sort of like crowd mentality yeah so um, how are we going to help these boys? Who's <laughs> um, bar journalists from ever speaking to them? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Line up all the journalists against a wall. Um, yeah. The I mean, the interesting point, like she she talks about how um, one of the most interesting points of the article where she basically says there are many different ways for a woman to express and live her femininity, but there's only one model of manhood yeah do you agree with that yeah on some level i think if you can be you know if well, you the women have like yeah sorry over time have developed more modes right and i think because of the triumph of feminism it now it's it's <clears throat> kind of legitimate and virtuous to say like hey i don't want to have a traditional marriage or a traditional family life i'm going to become a career woman become an and astronaut. That's, <laughs> yeah and that's like uh celebrated it's not frowned upon yeah but if you're not a certain type of like uh let's say hard-working provider as a man people yeah. sort of implicitly frown upon you well m- yeah men don't really have an alternative besides like being cucks yeah <laughs> that's like the, uh, those, those are the two modes sort of um and it's uh, another mm-hmm. interesting point is she's talking about uh, was about actually about women she writes um but while a 2018 national survey of more than a thousand to 10 to 19 year olds conducted by the polling firm periandum found that young women believed there were many ways to be a girl they could shine in math sports music leadership the big caveat being that they all still f- felt valued primarily for their appearance mm-hmm. young men described just one narrow route to successful masculinity which is like breadwinning yeah pr- breadwinning providing or whatever mm-hmm. um but it's interesting that i think that she's right that women still primarily compete with it, with one another over appearance right. or more kind of on a more rudimentary level their attractiveness to men sure and i tweeted this earlier that you know it, women generally speaking don't compete with each other over ideas which is both a good and a bad thing because they're not in the um, business of intellectual one-upmanship. Do you really think that though? Yeah, I mean, I think With, so. I mean, media is a very female-driven like sect, you know? And yeah, that's but, very much about ideas. I mean, okay, they, they do kind of trade trivia and information on a superficial level, but basically media, which is like a thoroughly feminized industry, is mostly about... Uh, social clicks and social ostracism right well all the girls like who drag us and write those mean articles in jezebel and stuff they're like they think that we're they're engaging with us like on an ideological level right uh, and al- sort of allegedly but positing that what our ideology is like dangerous yeah but they're really engaging with us on a social level which is why the attacks always turn ugly and personal yeah real quick really quick um and you know I think like not to toot my own own horn here, but I'm not in competition with them on the level that they think I'm in competition with them. I'm not competing with them. I'm debating ideas with them. I don't care about their social click or uh, our looks on a one to 10 scale or whatever. Yeah. But I think we generally speaking, I'm not, this, this is a gross generalization. There are exceptions on both sides, but 
women primarily operate on that level and men primarily operate like they compete with each other on intellect and increasingly less so on physical strength yeah way less so yeah so there's this like kind of intrinsic biological difference well what which well, may physical strength but also like power yeah you know i think yeah it's about like women and men we wield power in different ways basically right um <clears throat> anyway boyhood sorry I'm like, <laughs> uh yeah and the other thing that i think that somebody like on the sub brought up is that it was weird that this uh woman chose to focus on teenage boys mm. who are emotionally and physically unformed on some level. Right. Uh, they were saying it, m- it would have been more interesting if uh, she interviewed men from all different walks of life mm-hmm. who had long passed the kind of... Who had like processed their, right. their boyhoods already. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Because I think actually girls and boys are more alike at that age. Well, she says that... Oh, when- um she not about teens but younger she says that like um all the studies show sort of that before they before puberty essentially that boys have very rich like emotional lives and then they become sort of boxed in yeah i don't i also don't buy the idea that boys don't have rich emotional lives no of course they do but that they're not allowed to express them but i don't i don't even buy that i think that they do increasingly at least in the circles that we run and all they do is talk about their feelings (laughs) To us, to other guys. Well, yeah, that's also, I actually have no idea because we live on the coast. Mm-hmm. So all the, you know, two thirds of the men in <clears throat> New York are gay and the other <laughs> one third are homosexuals. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and it's like totally socially acceptable and viable to be like a faggy freak. Yeah, but I think <clears throat> they, men just express their kind of emotional subjectivity sorry for using all the ten dollar words mm-hmm. today mm-hmm. in a different way and i think this article just goes to show how much american cultural discourse is stuck in high school mode yeah which is why the only kind of uh it only sees thing, things through the lens of high school and collegiate metaphors the jock the frat boy right yeah that it was sort quite, of thing it felt very banal very scripted again yeah like all of the sort of insight she gleaned seemed like they were they came from boys who knew sort of what processes were taking place yeah i i think that they kind of yeah had kind of almost maybe subconsciously canned answers for her because mm-hmm. i think like for example the jock is an increasingly obsolete concept right right and it's funny because the high school uh, metaphor carries over into like adult life especially among professional managerial people so like members of the media class except with them the metaphor is inverted because it's like the triumph of the nerds Mm -hmm. and now the nerds are the ruling class in the cafeteria right who get to bully (laughs) everybody else and by preserving their underdog status especially totally um like the dumbs yeah but i was uh, the impression that i got from this journalist is that she was sort of pretending to be sympathetic when she talked about kind of the impoverished emotional landscape of teenage boys in America. But she also revealed herself to be kind of a contemptuous PMC careerist. There was like an implicit condescension Mm -hmm. and haughtiness toward um, these kids, like her own gender coded sense of moral superiority. Right. And they kept, they kept exceeding her expectations. Right. (laughs) Totally. I love how they were like, we we call each other bitch and pussy, but we don't ever say the N word or the F word. Bullshit. (laughs) Bullshit. Yeah, I'm not buying that for a second. And you, you know, calling your calling your friends a pussy is fine. It's fine. Girls do it, too. What did you think about um, the Mm -hmm. the rape joke stuff? I mean, also seems sort of par for the course and banal and not as big of a, you know sort of the overblownness of rape culture as this like toxic fixture in boys lives i don't think is i don't know but i don't know because i live in new york (laughs) yeah that's true Um, i mean i grew up in a suburban high school and there was definitely a lot of like locker room talk and most of which i was not privy to 
uh, and there was a lot of like rape jokes and like poop humor and stuff like that. But generally, if you hooked up with a boy, they were kind of almost nervously concerned with their performance and whether or not they were able to satisfy you. Yeah. Well, she makes that case. Yeah. A little bit. Um, I forget what her. I know. What do you think her agenda is? I guess. I think it's to write a puff piece for the Atlantic that, yeah, I mean, this goes back and ends there. Well, yeah. And this goes back to the bigger question of who is this for? Mm -hmm. Um, I have my suspicions. Hmm. My feeling about it is that it's for kind of self involved, self actualizing, uh, boomer and gen X parents Mm. who hide behind their progressive politics. Like, to kind of offload their feelings of parental guilt yeah. while preserving their sense of moral superiority. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, well, we taught him that saying the F word and the N word is bad. <laughs> we taught him that Trump is the bad orange man in office. Mm-hmm. We taught him that Obama said that women were morally superior than men. We sat him down and yeah. We sat him down and told him. We that, gave him some good models for masculinity. <laughs> yeah. like Now, son. Did you know girls can be scientists yeah. too son <laughs> yeah we taught him how to respect women blah 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 we told him to ask permission <laughs> to tell her that she's beautiful <laughs> <laughs> and yet at the end of the day they horribly failed as parents because they weren't there and they couldn't lead by example yeah and it's also for a very insular media class to mm-hmm. you know sort of perpetuate these puff pieces being written yeah and then i think it's for like um again pmc uh gen xers and millennials who are by and large childless because they too have uh, misallocated all their energies into like actualizing on a professional level Mm -hmm. um who also want to gloat on some level in their moral superiority because they uh it's not even like a nostalgic kind of uh, throwback to their former glory days being like rapey jocks and hot sorority girls. It's that they never had that moment because they were like gay nerds in college <laughs> and high school. Uh-huh. <clears throat> and they can, and it's like me too. They get to like witness the, the sexual salaciousness of some teen fantasy play out. It's like all these hot thick neck guys throwing women into lockers and right. saying, I'm going to rape you. <laughs> Like, welcome to the dollhouse style. Well, yeah. Right. And the thing you say also about how, um, you know, women think they're mad at men because they're, like, uh, oppressive and hostile, but actually they're mad at men because they're indifferent. Right, exactly. And it's, like, all these uh, kind of, like, female journalists who want to rationalize their failures with men by kind of saying like look this is how guys always are they're even like this in in elementary school and high school they have mm-hmm. all these rape fantasies and <laughs> they're into like flexing their power and being sexual authoritarians and humiliating and dehumanizing women yeah which is not the case and increasingly less less and less so mm-hmm. you know and there, there will be another article in the atlantic in a week about <clears throat> how teens don't have sex anymore right exactly you know I think it's sad that we live in a world where teenage boys know what toxic masculinity is. <laughs> totally. <laughs> like they have to grapple with this like totally made up concept. <laughs> toxic masculinity is like impeachment. It's fake. It's distractionary. <laughs> right. And what's actually, you know, again, what's actually taking place is people are being like disenfranchised uh, materially. Yeah. Men especially. Yeah. There's no... There's and that's what breeds what we call toxic masculinity. Right. There's not only a lack that of... that they don't have the option to be, like, powerful. Right. To, to fulfill... I mean, men, men, from what I understand, you can correct me if I'm wrong, on a fundamental level, they like to fulfill tasks and sure obligations. Yeah. They like it when they you give them... They love to have a job. Yeah. And you're like, <laughs> baby, can you come over and install my AC? And he's like, I'm down. <laughs> that's yeah these boys need to be given um more menial labor to do (laughs) they need to be given jobs at amazon (laughs) fulfilling orders (laughs) they need to drive me to my appointments yeah we have to take (laughs) these disenfranchised boys down a peg um 
she has a quote where she acknowledges she talks about how like the concept of masculinity has changed since the 20th century like in the 19th century men were expected to be sensitive and caretaking and how um this kind of brutish stereotype of the authoritarian male came about with the rise of capitalism like industrial capitalism no shit yeah um and she says today many parents are unsure of how to raise a boy what sort of masculinity to encourage in their sons and and then she adds but as i learned from talking with the boys themselves the culture of adolescence which fuses hyper rationality with domination sexual conquest and a glorification of male violence fills the void um and I think the crisis of masculinity lies in the fact that we've cheapened the value of traditional manhood through mm-hmm. mostly economic processes like technological automation, yeah. labor outsourcing. And at the same time, we continue, at least latently, to fetishize the sexual aspects. Right. All the while telling young men that it's actually toxic to behave <laughs> in certain sexually dominant ways. <laughs> right. And that's the tri- the real triumph of liberal feminism. Yeah. The, the problem is not the boys. It's the journalists. We're insisting that we have a problem <laughs> with, with boys. modern boys. Right. <laughs> I got, we've... Should we talk about the the wing? Wow, we talked for a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of these entitled men. Yeah. You, did you know they've been invading? <laughs> they've been a, invading. A, feminine, <laughs> a female only space, the wing. Yeah. <laughs> this is the new twist in the wing saga. Right. So they can't, they weren't allowed to like actually officially bar men from entering a women's social club oh yeah because of the you know whatever they have an eleven thousand man i mean women women membership eleven thousand women nationally are members of the wing so they're so there's um they're not allowed to now claim like special club status which was and I guess I didn't know this, but they never filed paperwork to be an officially woman's space, which would cause this kind of investigation. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so then they did just sort of like a vague kind of like, well, we can't ask anyone how they identify. Right. You know, but so. this was an article in the New York post that basically says men are coming into the wing in increasing numbers. Yeah. Not, b- but straight. It can't be or, that. It can't men. be that bad. This is bullshit. I think this is strategically placed PR by the wing. Ooh. That's my side. Smart. Which is smart. <laughs> that's, that's what I think. Cause mm. the, the article itself is so like light and jocular. Caitlin yeah. Phillips makes an appearance. She does. She says something funny where she says they're just like, it's probably just people's boyfriends being dragged there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She's like, they're cuck boyfriends. <laughs> Imagine taking your boyfriend to the wing. And I know it's that's so sad. <laughs> yeah. Wait, waiting for you while you get your blowout. Yeah. It's like the Nordstrom ma- like husband section where they're all sitting around while women try clothing on, <laughs> but with like a professional pretense. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. But, I don't, I, yeah, I don't buy it either. Why would a man want to go to the wing? I don't know. And okay. They're to troll, I guess. To yeah. troll. Yeah. They're like on record as saying that if you are like a biological man, but you identify as a woman, i.e. if you're transgender, then you're welcome at the wing. Yeah. So that's not a problem. Of course. So we're talking about like straight and or gay guys who are like cis or whatever. Yeah. Sorry, I don't really know the terminology. It's a little over my head. They should let gay guys in. Yeah. Equinox is basically a women and gay guy space. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's I feel very safe there. Yeah, it's like gays and girls, just like a red scare show. Exactly. I mean, I we think, said this. It's the the better co working space in the wing. Equinox. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the girls and gays alliance needs to. We we should affirm. <laughs> yeah, I'll take a stand. But my my hunch is that this problem of men invading the wing is overblown. It's like the Chad surgery. It's not a thing. It's a made up post headline and also like um so caitlin was like these are like the cucked boyfriends of of wing Wing members members. but there's also women bringing in like guys for their investment meetings because they are trying to like finance a startup or like a movie or something and that's you need men to do that yeah and it's like well okay you can't get upset about that you wanted women to be empowered career women so you can't get pissed off when they bring their associates in there right to extract money from them (laughs) for their various projects yeah and like crucially they didn't really cite any examples of men being like that annoying in the wing there was a quote from someone who refused to be named who said a guy even checked her out recently 
Can you imagine? <laughs> I know. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I'm doing my girl bossery. Yeah. Someone would be attracted to me. How dare they? I know. <laughs> They're so horned up by my sheer grit and power. <laughs> the way I dominate the boardroom. <laughs> There was a 53-year-old guy who sued them for gender discrimination. I was like, what is a 53-year-old doing there? It's like one of like Jeffrey Epstein's colleagues or associates. It's just one of those like bored New York guys who like, you know. I'm trying to pick up chicks at the wing. There was a guy uh, taking photo. I was doing a photo shoot recently. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Not to brag. Uh, and there was a guy who started taking pictures of me also like an old dirty old man and we were like can you stop and he was like well was, I'm within my legal rights you actually can were like, you outside yeah I was outside okay. I was like well, I guess he's right <laughs> <laughs> go ahead whatever gets you off yeah wait, wait he was just like there with a smartphone taking pics yeah he took some photos of me of you or the crew of what was me, his interest of, like, of them so taking cre- pictures of me that's creepy but I see how somebody it's, he's well within his that, rights yeah. to do that i guess but like i don't know whatever my <laughs> feeling is like the wings like whole women only policy thing is nominal too this is not this isn't even a club for rich people it's a club for like aspirational people who want to cozy up to the rich right. like gelman's a real genius because she capitalized on her gentle mockery of the middle class mm. by opening this club and it's like these are people who just don't want to encounter poor people in the flesh <laughs> It's not about men or, or women. Yeah. They just need a space to go. Yeah. You, they can't they be can't. like posted up at Little Canal because the minute that you walk out, some guy asks you for a dollar and you feel like dirty and ashamed <laughs> at yourself because you don't want to like rifle through your bag. Right. Anyway, well, I really can't think of anything worse than being in a setting filled with professional women. I went to a women's college. And but by the end of it, I, like, can, I came out a misogynist. You came so. out of misogynist. <laughs> I'm like, I would rather be in a gangbang <laughs> than be at the wing. Rather, Those guys I'd would be, be way a, nicer to me. I'd rather be in a Santa con yeah. gangbang. <laughs> like mascara s- streaming down your face. <laughs> All right. Anyway. Shall we? Yeah. See you in, see hell. You in hell.